yeah, uh, let's introduce myself uh, first, or at least I have an extra slide for that as well. Uh, so Jorik, as mentioned, I'm a data engineer at Agen. I'm in the data platform development team. And in my uh, spare time, I play tennis and padel tennis. So in between watching the Airflow Summit this week, I'm also watching a bit of Roland Garros. Um, yeah, so what does Agen do? So we provide a single payment platform globally to accept payments and grow revenue online on mobile and at the point of sale. Now, you might have heard of us, you might not have heard of us, and that's because we are a business to business uh, company. Um, and we have actually pretty big clients. So here you see some examples, Facebook, BlaBlaCar, AliExpress, LinkedIn, Uber, Dropbox, Microsoft, Spotify, eBay, PlayStation. Uh, yeah, really cool companies. And uh, we, uh, we are proud to call them our merchants. Um, yeah, so let's talk about uh, the sort of the big data platform and the workflow that we have. So as I mentioned, uh, we are fully on premise. We have all the servers in house. And that means that we manage everything from the hardware to the software. And of course, we also have different clusters. We have a beta test and a live cluster. And for the infrastructure teams to test new uh, applications, we also have a sandbox cluster. Um, furthermore, we do weekly releases. We start out every week on Tuesday with a new release branch. And we, uh, we basically apply patches to it. And then uh, on Thursday, it's deployed to test. And on Monday, the week after, it's deployed to live. And now about our team setup, or as you'll probably hear me call the rest of the presentation, we call them streams. Uh, we have over 20 streams and in total 100 data scientists on the big data platform right now. And the streams are responsible for their own DAGs, but uh, more on that later. So a little bit of information about our Airflow setup. We are currently running Airflow 2.2. We didn't have the time yet to upgrade to 2.3 yet. Um, we are running the salary workers and all our Spark, Dask, and Druid jobs, they're launched in a Yarn queue. So from salary, it uh, basically spins them up in Yarn. And uh, the back end of Airflow is uh, set up to be Postgres database. And what we're mostly going to be talking about is the extensions we built upon Airflow. And these are model, views, database listeners. Um, yeah, that's what we're going to get into uh, now. Uh, furthermore, we're running three salary workers, three schedulers, three web servers, and we're going to schedule uh, the salary workers, or sorry, we're going to grow the number of salary workers soon for our live cluster. So why a data mesh? Uh, but first of all, what is a data mesh? If, you, if you've never heard of the term, you probably have. Just a short summary. It's a monolithic data infrastructure where you have distributed domains and each domain is responsible for their own ETL and data. Um, yeah, you also have different kinds of databases often. Uh, so not everything is in one database in a data mesh setup. Um, but yeah, I'll, this is a short summary. So what we really liked about the data mesh and why we chose it is because we wanted to have product teams with a clear focus. We have teams that combine uh, front-enders, back-enders, data scientists, sometimes even analytic engineers. Uh, and they're all in a single team to really focus on one single product. And furthermore, we also really like not having one central ETL team where really the amount of data engineers or ETL engineers that you hire is the bottleneck for the entire platform. And also we really like this self-service where basically the, the product teams are doing everything themselves. So it's not really the case that the product teams are doing everything themselves, of course, because we have the tooling teams in between and uh, that is uh, my team is considered a tooling team as well. And they basically provide the tools necessary for the product teams to create an ETL and try to abstract as much complexities away from the whole process so that for them, it's really just defining an Airflow DAG um, and uh, Spark code or uh, DAG code. And then uh, it's basically, they're able to, to run it. Um, 
Furthermore, we also, of course, have infrastructure teams who provide the whole, uh, all the hardware. All right. So now let's take a look at uh, what someone at ITN would need to do to, or in general, would need to do to create a new data pipeline. Well, first of all, you need to create an Airflow DAG, and you need to create the ETL code. So as you can see on the right image, we have Airflow, and it starts a Spark job in this case. And um, it gets data from the identity risk domain and from the KYC domain from different kind of databases. We have some ETL code in the middle, and it stores it in the end in the acquiring ETL. So this is probably a job from the acquiring domain. Or sorry, it stores it in the acquiring uh, HDFS uh, storage. So actually, it's not really so simple. Because we need to define the schema. We need to make sure we have enough resources for the ETL. Otherwise, we might get memory errors. We need to be able to update the schema if there's, for example, a new column. We need to make sure that we don't keep uh, infinite amount of storage so that uh, we, we wipe storage or sorry, wipe data that we no longer need. We need to have the, uh, the functionality to remove a table. And how do we basically allow all our users to, uh, to work with this efficiently without being able to modify other domains resources? Now, this is what we're going to get into uh, today. So first of all, we're going to cover these table schemas and how can we enable schema evolution. Then we're going to go to tuning resources. How can we handle data outgrowing the predefined ETL resources, uh, retention period, how can we save ACFS from being filled with data that we don't need anymore, where ACFS is our storage layer? Uh, user permissions, how can we give user permissions access to only the parts that they need so they are not able to modify resources from other domains? All right, let's start with table schemas. So we are managing an ETL pipeline, and now how and where do we define the schema? How do we update the schema? And how do we delete tables that we no longer need? So we basically, um, the, we have uh, each domain have their own database. And a, a database might have multiple scopes. So it might be PII, private, or public, where PII is uh, whitelisted data and it contains yeah, personally identifiable information. Uh, private is by default only accessible to people within the domain, and public is accessible by everyone who has access to the big data cluster. Now, each database scope, so a database and a scope, can have multiple tables, and then each table has at least one change file. Um, and now, these change files, they really have only four types, which is a new table, a uh, compatible, or sorry, a new table, yeah, a compatible uh, table change. So, for example, a new column, an incompatible table change, uh, changing the type of a column, and a remove when we remove the table. And all this information is stored in our uh, table schemas library. Now, we also created a simple tool for our streams to basically uh, create a Spark ETL, uh, Spark ETL, get the data frame out, and then based on the data frame, it creates the schema file for you. Now, let's take a look at Analytics Core. Here you can see that Analytics Core only has tables in the public scope. And you see two tables, Spark push filters and table metadata. And now, for both of these tables, there's at least one change. You see that in V110, the Spark push filters table was introduced. And two versions later, there was an incompatible table change because one of the, column, uh, one of the columns changed in type. So uh, that was the Spark push filters. And you see that for V112, table metadata was introduced. Now, how is the process flow for this uh, library and introduce, or introducing changes to table schemas? So the first thing is to update or create the schema file, which is uh, the DDL file that you saw on the previous slide. The next thing is introducing the schema change file. 
So a new or compatible change. And then you need to create a merge request for it, get someone from your team or domain to review it and approve it, and then finally merge it. Now, this is the part on the user end. And now let's take a look at the part on the cluster side. So we would release a new version on the cluster. So that would happen on Tuesday. And uh, or Tuesday for beta, Thursday for test, of course, and live on Monday. And then after the release has been successful, the duty will roll out all the schema change files for that specific release. And optionally, if there's something wrong with the table, a user can also perform some ad hoc table, uh, uh, table operations, like redefining the table with the latest schema. Now uh, let's go over to the not so live demo. Uh, here you see our table management view, and on the left side, you see the logs. So these are uh, logs from previous runs. Now you see the ad hoc table changes, and here you can define your uh, database, table name, your scope, your privacy, and then what you want to do on the table. So for example, deleting the Hive table record, uh, defining the table again, deleting the table data, etc. Um and here you see the table changes. And as you can see, it starts with the release candidate version, change type, et cetera, uh, and then the status. And you see that the top four changes, uh, they don't have a status yet. So what we're going to do is we're going to roll them out. So we're going to select V112, and we're going to select rollout changes. We're going to press OK. And it takes a little bit for the Spark job to complete, of course. But once it completes, you can see the logs here. At the top, you can see the dropping table for API performance from the monitoring Hive database and Spark Warehouse. And you see a couple of logging lines, which are pretty much debug logging lines. But the most important part is this white check mark. So the table roll for Bart succeeded, for Lisa, and the two for March also succeeded. Now let's go back into our table management view. And the first thing you'll notice is that the four changes we just rolled out are now a success. And also the logging file that, uh, of the previous run is now also present here. All right, let's move on to the next item of today. Tuning resources. Uh, as we are on-premise, uh, we have a finite number of resources. We can't just give every job uh, an enormous amount of resources. That would also be very costly in cloud, of course. Um, but yeah, it brings some limits. And we hard, -code, we hard code all the resources that we use for all our ETLs in our code base. But now imagine that a DAG has been running successfully for 100 days, and on day 101, you get this error code 143. What do you do? Well, like any developer, you Google the issue. And as the first line already says on the Google result, access co exit code 143 is related to memory garbage collection issues. So the idea would probably be to set a higher Spark driver and a worker memory limit. However, we hard coded that in our code, uh, in the code base. So that would require the user to create an MR, request an approval, create an official patch request, uh, get an approval for the patch request, and then we do the patching, after which he can finally rerun the job. And this flow takes at least two hours. Um, and so we wanted to prevent patching for, for something like this. So, uh, Let's see uh, what we did. Again, a not so live demo. This is a simple DAC, uh, Spark Daily Append. And uh, the first task is a, a sensor for some other DAC. And the second task is a simple ETL process. And you see the last one failed. So we're going to go into the logs. And at the top of the logs, you can see the commands that are being passed to Spark. Here you see, for example, that the Spark executor memory was only one gigabyte. And the Spark driver memory was two gigabyte. The Spark executor cores are four, and we have four executors. So one gigabyte is not really a lot for a worker. And here we see 
that the job actually failed on exit code 143. Container exited with a non-zero exit code 143. Um, yeah, you have a very lengthy error message, but this is really the only important line of the entire error. And so what are we going to do? We are uh, going to copy over this uh, Spark executor memory. So now it's on the clipboard. And we're going to go to Spark configuration. And here we are going to add a configuration for the task that just failed. So that is Spark daily append slash run Spark ingestion job. We copy the, or sorry, we paste the, uh, the string and we're going to set it to four Gs. So four gigabyte. And this is, uh, you need to set this in JSON format. So we're going to press save. And you can see here that it's a nice view of uh, all the custom configurations that you set. So uh, you see that's for analytics core and uh, it was set by the username Ajan. And this, now next time you run this uh, task, uh, it will basically use four gigabytes for uh, Spark executor memory. And this will probably solve the error that you've seen. You saw that this was for Spark configuration, but we also have a similar view for Dask and for Druid. All right, next topic, the retention period. As I mentioned, we have a finite storage. And if we are close to the storage limit, there are really only two options. You either buy more servers, which is quite a difficult task nowadays with the chip shortage, or you get rid of some, some of your data. But asking the domains to get rid of the data is, yeah, it's not really easy because everyone needs the data at the moment you ask for it, right? So uh, yeah, we should just prevent getting close to the data and chew or sort of get rid of all data that they don't need any longer. So we introduced the governance library for this. And each stream has a stream file, as we call it, in this library. And there, they define all the tables and the corresponding retention periods. So for example, here you see that on line five, we define a retention period for three months for the table parquet file size. We define a retention period of one month for parquet metadata row count, one year for Spark push filter, and three years for table metadata. I have to put a disclaimer here. Most of our data is partitioned by date, and it might be much complexer, much more complex to implement this if you are not partitioning by date. Uh, so in our case, we have a DAG called retention-based removal. And as you can see, the first task is perform retention-based removal, and the second task is get retention uh, removal. And basically, this first task is actually performing the removal, right, as the name says. And the first task is skipped because at that point there were no, uh, there were, there was no previous run, so it doesn't know what to remove. And at the moment, the sorry, and the get retention removal task, it computes what to remove next week. So that's also yeah, that explains why the first uh, task is always skipped. Right, so what would that look like when uh, this get retention removal partitions uh, has been executed? Uh, oh, sorry, I forgot to add. You see that we have these two tasks for each of our streams. So basically, uh, if we have, in this case, we have three streams, so we have six tasks in total. Um, and here we see this view that basically lists all the retention removal plans that were computed and their corresponding sta uh, statuses. So for Spark push filters, you see that retention period was actually a year. And each week, it basically removes everything that's from one year and one week till one year old. Um, and for table metadata, you see that the retention period is actually one week. And at every time, it removes the data from two weeks old till one week old. And you see that for both of them, we had one successful removal and one is still staged to be executed uh, on the 25th, which uh, was yesterday, but I created this demo earlier, of course. 
And you can see some actions here where uh, we can set specific lines to uh, cancel so that it doesn't get executed, or we can set them back to staged or remove it completely. All right. So user permissions. We really want to empower the streams so they truly become self-service. However, they should never be able to modify uh, anything but their own resources. And this includes Spark resources, their own DAGs. They should be able to modify uh, or to use our custom views, but only on their resources. And also, of course, the, uh, the streams tables. So let's take a look into how we define the user groups on our platform. First of all, we always have one on-duty admin. So he is available 24-7 for any uh, emergency call or any emergency operations. Um, and then we divided, or we have two more groups. We have stream admin and we have the standard users. And these stream admins, they're able to manage all the DAGs of the teams, manage all the tables of their database, and manage the Spark resources of their tasks and a couple more operations in our custom views. Now, let's take a look at how these permissions are defined actually in Airflow. So I mentioned here Flask app builder permissions because that is actually the thing that Airflow uh, built its web, a web interface on. So it's using Flask app builder in the background um, and therefore also the roles or sorry, also the sort of permission setup that Flask App Builder has. So the first thing we have is a view and we have a base permission. And the view and the base permission are together combined to a permission on view. And as you can see on the right side in the middle, multiple permissions on view might be given to one specific role. And for one user, it might one user might have multiple roles. And now what do these, uh, in terms of permissions, what do these permission on views look like? So for each DAG, we have at least, or we have exactly two uh, permission on views. So my DAG dot can read and my DAG dot can edit. But also each function in a view has a, a permission on a view as well. So for example, of Spark configuration that we just saw, you have Spark configuration that can add, Spark configuration that can edit. And for roles, we create basically one basic role for all users, right? Um, but really, we just modify the standard user's role and one role for each stream admin group. Now, how do we implement this? On each release, all the permissions per role are updated. Uh, we created some cool decorators to indicate who has access because I always forgot basically to define the access rights in a different file. So I figured it should be right where the code is. Uh, we create some validators to raise exception when someone tries to modify a resource that it has no access on. And we modified our view to only show the runnable parts. So uh, let's have uh, another demo. Here you see I have two users. I created the AC user and the Agen user. The Agen user is an admin, and the AC user is a stream admin for analytics core. So as a user and stream analytics core. Now I'm logged in with the admin user or with the Agen user, and you can see I'm able to roll out the changes like we've seen before. I'm going to log out, log in with the AC user. And we're going to go back into the stable management view. So here we are again. And you can see that now we have the same table view. So we see the same data, but we can't modify anything here. Um, and we're now going to do an ad hoc table change on a database that is not ours. And what you see here is you're going to get a validation error that you do not have permission to modify tables from database monitoring. And this is how, how we basically uh, prevent our, our stream admins from modifying items from other domains. Uh, uh, yeah, small disclaimer, we are not uh, UI developers. So yeah, I think this error message page looks really bad, but uh, I, yeah. 
All right. Then uh, we showed how we define the roles. We showed how uh, how we basically set these permissions, but uh, or sorry, how yeah, how our views change. But we haven't really shown how we map users to the actual roles, and uh, this had to be done via LDAP from our security team. And so what we did is we set up a service that runs each hour that basically checks the LDAP groups. And if you're in the stream admin LDAP group for that specific stream, you get, ad you get that role added to you in Airflow. If you're no longer in that LDAP group, you get the, remo the role removed. All right, a wrap up. So we covered the table uh, schemas and how one can enable schema evolution over time and how we basically abstracted away all the complexities for our end users. The tuning of the resources, how we could prevent patching for data overflowing its ETL source resource limits and uh, basically make it much faster for a job to get back up running again. We showed the retention period how we work with a limited storage and wipe out wipe data that we no longer need, and user permissions. We showed how each domain has their own database uh, and is only able to modify its own resources. All right, before I forget, of course, we're a tech company, and yes, we are also hiring. Um, our head office is in Amsterdam. And we are opening new tech ups in Chicago and in Madrid. So if you're interested, feel free to scan the QR code uh, or reach out. Uh, we have a lot of open vacancies for, uh, for Java developers, data engineers, data scientists, uh, yeah, you name it. All right, thank you, that was it.